my topic is applied apologetics. I'm going to look at two texts. Uh, one is a text that Dr. Godfrey used last night, so I will briefly touch on it. But an Old Testament text and a New Testament text, and my point is this, that as we look at Scripture, we can actually find models in Scripture for us as apologists. So the first model is a text I'm sure you're very familiar with. It's Psalm 19. We often turn to Psalm 19 as a psalm that gives us great insight into the doctrine of revelation. Uh, What we find in this psalm is that it breaks down very nicely into a psalm, a hymn, of general revelation in verses 1 to 6. And then the psalmist, David, turns his attention to special revelation at verse 7, and that keeps us through verse 13, and then the psalm ends with a prayer. So, verses 1 to 6, a hymn to general revelation and what general revelation teaches us about God, and then special revelation. I think what we find here is not only a helpful text for the doctrine of Scripture, but if we take a step back, we're seeing a model here for apologetics. And so, the psalmist begins with what the psalmist sees. Verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Awed by the universe. And as the psalmist is awed by the universe, the psalmist raises the question, where did this come from? The origin of this universe and it's God. And not only is there a universe that exists, it is a universe that shows order and structure. And so, verse 2, day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them He has set a tent for the sun." which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It's rising from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. And tomorrow morning, the sun will do it all over again. And the next day, the sun will do it all over again. And so, the psalmist starts with general revelation or the natural world, and uses the natural world both in terms of its immensity, of being awed by it, and also by its structure and by its order, and by how the natural world also provides everything necessary for us to live and move and have our being. And so, the psalmist is saying, nature points us to a Creator, and nature points us to a God. Then the psalmist says, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And the psalmist proceeds then to turn our attention to the revealed Word of God, or what theologians call special revelation. And what special revelation reveals about God, reveals about us, and reveals about how we who are separated from God can find our way back to God. So, what we have in here in this psalm is the use of both nature and Scripture as a means to proclaim God as Creator and God as Redeemer. Psalm 19, a good model for us as apologists, because we have both of those as well. We have the world and we have the Word, and the world is a testimony to the presence and the existence of God as the good Creator. Well, the other New Testament text that's a bit of a model for us is Acts chapter 17. We were in this last night with Dr. Godfrey. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. I just want to point out a few things. I find every element of this moment instructive as a model for apologetics. You could break this down at chapter 17, verses 16 through the end of the chapter, so verses 16 through 34 we have the introduction to the speech, and that's verses 16 to 21. 
We have the speech itself, verses 22 to 31, and then we have the response to the speech, 32 to 34, and each one of those is instructive. What we find first in the introduction to the speech is that Paul observed. He walked around, he saw, he engaged the world. Not only that, but we see that Paul goes. He goes to two places. He goes to the synagogue. And when he goes to the synagogue, there he is engaging Jews. And then he also goes to the marketplace. Now, that seems a little bit obvious, but we should make the observation explicit. Paul goes to where people are. He goes to the synagogue where there is a need to know who Jesus is, and he goes to the marketplace where there is an exact same need, but with a different people. And what does he do when he goes into the synagogue? This is another thing that we can learn. Paul knows the audience that he addresses. When he goes to the synagogue, he starts in the Old Testament, and he starts with that common ground that he has with those in the synagogue that shared understanding of the Old Testament, and then He uses that Old Testament to point them to Christ and to point them to Jesus as the Messiah who comes in fulfillment of everything they've been studying and learning and hearing. When He goes to the marketplace, He doesn't start with the scrolls. We'll see in the speech what He does start with. But He goes, He knows His audience. He's actively observing the world in which he lives. And we can't miss this subtle point that Luke makes in verse 16. His spirit was provoked within him. Now, in our translations, we have small s spirit, indicating to us that the translators here are wanting us to see this, the sort of inner person, his inner person is provoked. But what we see here is Paul is sensitive. He's tuned in. He's acutely aware of when he is being pushed and when he is being directed. And so his spirit was provoked. Remember, I said this yesterday, this wonderful verse, Philippians 1, 16, I am put here for the defense of the gospel, Paul's mission statement. And so here he is in Athens, time on his hands. He could easily take some well-deserved time off, but his spirit's provoked because there's a people with a need. So, before we rush into the speech itself, itself, pause a little bit at those introductory verses and just see what can be learned there for us as apologists from Paul as a model. Then when we get to the speech itself, uh, what do we see? Uh, we see that Paul knows his audience. While he was walking around observing, he saw the idol to the unknown God. He quotes the poets. He, he quotes Agabus. He knows what Greeks were after and what they devoted their time to. In him we live, we move, and we have our being. Those were the big philosophical discussions and debates that have been going on in Greco-Roman philosophy for the last millennia, from the beginning of the philosophical quest among the Greeks. It was understanding being. It was understanding motion. And it was understanding the very nature of existence and the meaning of life. And here Paul sums up this Greco-Roman quest for the last centuries in saying, all of that is found in God. In Him we live and move and have our being. He has common ground with his audience, but he also knows where the gospel challenges his audience. Apologetics is a bit of a double-edged sword. There is a sense in which the apologist finds common ground to engage a person. So the common ground in the synagogue is the Torah scroll and Isaiah. The common ground with the Greek philosophers is their quest for the ultimate and the absolute and the questions 
to motion and being and existence and meaning of life. Plato's transcendent being. Aristotle's pure act being. But it's a double-edged sword because apologetics is not just finding common ground. Apologetics is finding where the gospel challenges and confronts and where there are roadblocks and oppositions. It's mentioned here, Luke tells us that there are Stoics and Epicureans in the audience, the two main schools of thought in the first century. And the Epicureans, now these are not to be confused with the hedonists, today we don't have many Epicureans. Today we have mostly hedonists. It's lunchtime and all of you have skipped lunch, so you're likely hungry, so hopefully this illustration will make you even hungrier. You know the difference between a hedonist and an Epicurean? An Epicurean likes a four-ounce filet mignon cooked to perfection, wrapped in sizzling bacon. Can you smell it? You know what the hedonist likes? The 48-ounce T-bone steak full of fat and gristle. That's the difference between an Epicurean and a hedonist. We don't live in an Epicurean culture. We live in a hedonist culture, the pursuit of unbridled pleasure. Of course, that unbridled, that pursuit of unbridled pleasure simply boomerangs back in pain. We've all done this when we've gone to buffets. unbridled pursuit of pleasure, and then we pay for it. But these are Epicureans. But you know one thing about the Epicureans? They didn't come out and deny the afterlife. They were just skeptical about it. And they came to the conclusion that it probably doesn't exist, so we might as well not bank on it, and we might as well live this life as if this is all there is. And what does Paul do? He hits that head on. There is Jesus, and there is the resurrection, and there is a judgment to come. So what we learn from Paul here is that apologetics is a bit of a double-edged sword. It's finding common ground, and it's finding where the gospel confronts and challenges. You could jump into his speech more, find more models for being an apologist, but I'm going to quickly move to the response. I find the response very instructive. Now, verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Now, oh, these are the Epicureans. And what did they say? They mocked. They thought He was going to give them something new. They thought He was going to bring some new idea. They were all intrigued by this guy. We've dismissed this long ago this idea of an afterlife. And so they mock him and jeer. These are the Epicureans. But beyond that specific thing we learn from the response, we really find that it falls into three groups of people, doesn't it? We have those who just reject. And then in 32b it says, but others said, we will hear you again about this. Now, I never know how quite to take this. You know, is this that call you get, the, the solicitation for maybe some really good cause? And you know you don't really want to give, but you don't want to be mean to the person, so you say something like, can you mail me something and I'll think about it? You know, there's always that, uh, we will hear you, oh, sure, yeah, let, come back tomorrow, we'll be glad to listen to you. If only inspiration came to us with voice inflection, wouldn't that be helpful? They could be just patronizing Paul. Or it could be sincere. Wow. This is, this is interesting. Let's think this over. We want to hear you talk about this again. I don't know, but whichever one it is, it's non-committal. It's non-committal. And then we have some who believe. This is encouraging, isn't it? This is the Apostle Paul, probably one of the smartest human beings who ever lived. He was an intensely driven person. I don't like the expression 24-7. We should at least say 24-6, right, Dr. Godfrey, for a day of rest. <laughs> Paul was a driven person. 
It was ambitious. It was under inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he wrote books. He was an apostle. And listen to this. Every time he preached the gospel, he did not bat a thousand. It should be encouraging. Encouraging to us. We can get so discouraged that we're not always seeing people just come to Christ and think everything we say is absolutely brilliant and they're persuaded and convicted. We can be encouraged by this mixed response from Paul. So we have examples. We have models in Scripture for us as apologists. We have Psalm 19. We have Acts 17. We have other examples. In many ways, we can make a case that the Bible is one big apologetic textbook. You know, you go back to the beginning of the creation account, and you compare that to other ancient Near Eastern texts. There were a number of these ancient Near Eastern texts. Uh, We call them cosmologies or cosmogenies, stories that explain the beginning of the world, a cosmogony. And the Egyptians had these, and the Babylonians had these, and all of them have something in common. There was a struggle among the gods, and one of the gods emerged out of that struggle and won the right to create the world, and they created the world. Now you go back and read the account of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 against the backdrop of these ancient Near Eastern cosmogenies, and what you see is stunning in its uniqueness. There's no struggle. There's no struggle. What's the refrain that carries all of these creation days? And God said it, and it was. And He said it, and it was. God merely spoke the world into existence. There was no cosmic struggle. The uniqueness of God, the uniqueness of Yahweh, and the uniqueness of the divine revelation of the Pentateuch against the gods of the ancient Near Eastern world and against the creation accounts of the ancient Near Eastern world. Right off the beginning, right off the bat, the Bible is an apologetic for who God is and the uniqueness of His revelation. And you can pull that thread all the way through the Bible. You see it in the prophets as they stand up and they literally make their case before Israel. You see it in the opening verses of Isaiah. And you see it in texts like Psalm 19 and Acts 17. So as we come to Scripture, not only do we see in Scripture a command to be an apologist, but we can also read it in such a way that we can see models of apologetics before us in Scripture to engage apologetics. Well, I want to turn a corner here in the remaining time that we have to talk a little bit more about applied apologetics in our day. So, we have Scripture as a model for us, but what are we dealing with in our day, and how can I just paint a little picture for you? First, can I mention two of R.C.'s books that I find incredibly helpful? One is The Consequences of Ideas, a wonderful book to understand the history of ideas and how all of that history of ideas has… sorry, history of ideas has now flowed into the 21st century, and we are seeing it the net effect, the conglomerate effect of all of these ideas and their consequences. The other book is his book, Defending the Faith, a wonderful book to lay out for you apologetics and an apologetic uh, methodology. So, I'd recommend those two books. As I look at what we're dealing with in the 21st century, I think we could say we have three big challenges in the room. One is Islam. The second, and this was what Ravi was talking about, the second is secularism, and the third is pluralism. I think those are the three big elephants in the room that we are dealing with. And I think as you engage some of the basic points that R.C. was making in defending the faith, you can see how they apply to each of those challenges. Now, first we come to Islam, and I just want to sketch this out. We should have a whole session on this for you, but I just want to sketch this out. As you're thinking about Islam and the challenge to Islam, I think we have to break it down in terms of three things. One is the Bible versus the Quran. Secondly is God versus Allah. 
And thirdly is Jesus versus Muhammad. There's no comparison. There is literally no comparison. And you put each one of those side by side, the differences and the distinction is so clear, so palpable. And so we often find this uh, idea, and this merges into this notion of pluralism, that there are all these commonalities, and in reality, there is not. And when you look at the Bible versus the Quran, we got into this a little bit in the Q&A session, they could not be more different as texts, not just in their, their reading, but in their origin and in their provenance. And you look at God versus Allah, these could not be more different beings in their presentation. God in Scripture is sovereign over His creation. He is never capricious and is never arbitrary. And as you look at Jesus versus Muhammad, you see that Jesus simply did not claim to be a prophet. You know, the, you hear this sometimes that Islam accepts the Gospels, but that's not entirely true. The idea is that the Old Testament was given, and then the Old Testament was corrupted, so a new prophet had to be sent. And that new prophet of Jesus was sent, and the Gospels were given, but the Gospels were corrupted. And so a new prophet had to be sent, and that was Muhammad. And the new revelation supersedes the old because it corrects. There's one particular surah in the Quran where Jesus, and this is interesting, if you ever look at this, the Quran always refers to Jesus as son of Mary. Why? It's emphasizing His humanity, isn't it? It's always Jesus, son of Mary. Jesus, son of Mary, God says to him, did you ever command men to worship you? God forbid. You know it's not so. For it was so, you would have known it. And the implication is, you would have snuffed me out. This is not the Jesus of the Gospels. Jesus did accept worship of Himself, and He commanded that we worship Him. So, just simply do a comparison. When it comes to secularism, the issue here, and I, I find this, to me I find it interesting, I, I see it really as a continuum. On the one hand, secularism has said, we don't need God. It's pushed God out, whether it's through the sciences or just through the amazing things that we've done, our understanding of things. Remember the cosmonaut in space? Hey, I'm up here in space, and guess what? No God. Secularism is about pushing God out. What that has created is, on the one hand, apathy, that people are simply apathetic to the, que the question of the existence of a God. But on the other hand, it's also created an antagonism. Apathy and antagonism. But here is the thing that secularism cannot deal with. It cannot deal with, it, with what is an uncontrovertible law of the universe that we bump into, the law of cause and effect. And the fundamental problem with secularism, it cannot deal with the question of the origin of all things. It does not have an adequate explanation for the cause of the effect that is, the effect being this world. And so we have the wonderful classical arguments for the existence of God all predicated on this law of cause and effect. And it is the Achilles heel of secularism to explain ultimately the origin of all things. Darwin's theory of evolution cannot do it, just simply cannot do it. Well, I have 20 seconds left to talk about pluralism. There's another law at work. 
called the law of non-contradiction. Law of non-contradiction. It can't be override, overridden. In order for pluralism to work, all these religions ultimately have to be saying the same thing. But go ahead and analyze them beyond the surface, and you will find that they are not. Even on this basic level, you take the Eastern religions, the ultimate end of an Eastern religion is what? Liberation of the person from the material into the immaterial. What is the ultimate end of Christianity? Redemption and union with God through Christ. That's a contradiction. Pluralism doesn't work because these various religions are not saying the same thing. They're not only saying different things, they're saying fundamentally contrary and contradictory things. So we do have tools at our disposal as apologists to respond to these big challenges that are facing us in this day and age. And I am absolutely certain that I have not answered nearly all the questions that you have, and that's okay, because at 2 o'clock we're going to be back here for a question and answer session. Dr. Godfrey will be on the platform, and you can ask him all of those questions. <laughs> and if he won't answer them, the progressive Dr. Thomas will. Thank you.